Hari Gunya Garden. Manja Naranonil, Kalaburunil, Kapuya Kalapulan. Wan Hari Gunya Garden. Yanani Maratu. Nayu Well, hello, I'm Amy Duggan and together with the chair and co-founder of the Minerva Network, Christine McLaughlin AM, we welcome you to our celebration of women in sport on this green and gold day. It is so wonderful to have so many of you joining us. Of course, today was supposed to be a live event at Stadium Australia and Sydney Olympic Park's Olympic live site, but like so much else over the last 18 months, COVID has caused us to pivot. It's challenged our determination, our dedication and our resilience. So here we are online and we thank you all for joining us today from wherever you are. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the lands on which we meet. Today, of course, there are... Oh, doing... I acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Darawal people and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you'll join us from today and we welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of our First Nations people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. It is so awesome too to see so many of our panellists and participants in your green and gold today as we celebrate women in sport. From equal pay agreements to amazing comeback stories, record audiences and new media deals, women's sports are in the spotlight now more than ever. Leading brands are now beginning to appreciate the value of aligning their brands to successful female athletes or para-athletes and properties that have growing fan bases. Sports leagues are being introduced, others are expanding, TV deals are being done and women are achieving remarkable results on the world stage and at home. But we need to recognise too that not all results are remarkable. In fact, some are tales of heartbreak, of the almosts, of the so close moments. And many are not about gold or glory at all. In fact, they're the triumphs and tribulations of the non-professional athletes who are struggling to make ends meet while putting all of their time, energy and funds into a belief and a desire to be the very best. Our Olympic team for Tokyo is the second largest contingent we've sent overseas. Among that team of 472 athletes is a record number of women, 254 in fact, pulling on the green and gold in Tokyo this month for the Olympics. And in August, it's our Paralympians turn with representation strong there too. For the first time, men and women will compete alongside each other on the track and in the pool in what's been termed the gender games. Although we all know there's always room for improvement. Locally, post Olympics, as this unprecedented pandemic tightens its grip, administrators, advocates, athletes, and all of you joining us today need to remain vigilant to ensure that women's sport is not relegated to the sidelines. Today on this event, we're shining a light on our women. They're doing a pretty good job so far and wasn't it wonderful and emotional to see Jess Fox, Ariane Titmus, Kayleigh McEwen, our Matildas, our Stingers, our Sevens, our Opals and our Hockey Roos all going great guns and some of those are back in action tonight. And of course, athletics gets underway today too with Hannah Basic and Rose Davies making their Olympic debuts. Today, we're gonna to celebrate the truly elite, the cream of the crop, those who've made it to the top and some who've gone on to excel. We'll hear from our recently appointed Minister for Sport, Natalie Ward, 
who you'll see is a massive advocate of women in sport. We'll get some insight from Paralympians and Olympians and their families. We'll celebrate their success and learn from their disappointments. And we'll also showcase the Minerva Network and how it's supporting our female athletes. Now on the Minerva Network, it is a not-for-profit organisation supporting over 180 athletes. And you can help by making a tax deductible donation to Minerva through the Australian Sports Foundation website. You can get involved today too on this webinar. We have the chance to ask deep burning questions you might have. And there is some time to still buy tickets to the raffle. There are some great prizes there, including corporate suites, a round of golf with Alyssa Healy. She'll probably win, just let me remind you of that. Or coaching from Maddie Proud among some other items that you can also see on the screen. The link for the raffle is in the chat. And if you haven't already grabbed a ticket, it'll be drawn a little bit after two and we'll encourage you to join in on social media. Also, those handles are on the side of my screen and also on the main screen. Events like this, of course, can't go ahead without the support of event sponsors. And on behalf of Christine and I and the Minerva Network across, we'd like to say a big thank you to our event sponsor, Western Sydney University, who stayed on stoically despite today's event being forced online. Our event partners, Business Western Sydney, Sydney Olympic Park Authority, Sydney Olympic Park Business Association, Stadium Australia, and Venues Live and Venues New South Wales. Now, all of our registered guests, you have been muted, but if you'd like to ask a question, you can pop it in the chat or in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. If you'd like to spread the word, as we said, you can search for the Minerva Network on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And the hashtags are hashtag Minerva Network, hashtag Celebrating Women in Sport, and hashtag Green and Gold Day. As we mentioned, today's event could not be possible without the generous support of Western Sydney University, represented today by Dr Andy Marks as the Assistant Vice-Chancellor at Western Sydney Uni and the CEO of the NUW Alliance. Andy leads a major strategic higher education initiative with the government, industry and community. He's also the Director of the Centre for Western Sydney, Chair of the Western Sydney Community Forum, and a non-executive director with Wentworth Healthcare. He's the founder of Catalyst West, Interactive Policy Forum, and the Launchpad Startup Incubator. And prior to this role, Andy was a researcher in the social services sector, a council member at the University of New England, and is an ARIA-nominated professional musician and composer. So for now, it's over to you for the official welcome, Andy. Great, thanks, Amy, and thanks everyone for joining us. I'm really the kind of uh, square peg in the round hole today. So uh, this is about the achievement of women. And I think the Olympics have just shown us, as Amy's mentioned, how extraordinary uh, women are, as if we needed reminding. I think um, as a university, we're very interested in researching how we get greater participation from women in the economy. And I think it's really brought to the public consciousness the, the success that is possible when you free women up to, to be a part of those things. And I think the recent examples we've seen in, in multiple leagues, some of which Amy mentioned, shows just uh, how much women can excel um, far and above the accomplishments of men in, in, similar, in similar fields. So it's so exciting to see that success play out again uh, in Tokyo, and particularly when we're all under the doona, quote unquote, um, waiting for uh, some kind of, uh, I guess, sign of optimism and they've delivered so it's been more than a, an achievement in sport. It's been an achievement in raising the social consciousness of, of what's possible if, if we uh, support women to be their best. Uh, and that's something we're committed to at Western Sydney University and in all of the roles that I have, um, we want bias. We absolutely want bias uh, the other way. It's not about um, men stepping off. It's about men stepping down so women can, can come on through. And, and that's the, the little part that we try and bring at the university. I've sat on too many panels and been to too many events um, where it's been wall to wall blokes and it's boring, it's stayed and it's the same old conversation. And isn't it exciting what's possible when you get women in the room and they lead. So that's it from me. Uh, suffice to say that um, the university has a very exciting uh, initiative in uh, planning for the Sydney Olympic Park area. I can't say anything more about it at this stage. Suffice to say, it's gonna be incredible uh, and I'll share details with you when I can, but um, we wanna get behind 
women's sport in particular, elite sport, in a very, very substantial way with a range of partners. And um, as soon as I can say something about that, I will. But today uh, is going to be a fantastic conversation. And as things go at the moment, with everything going virtual, I'm told that I'm actually here to introduce a virtual minister, or the real minister, in fact, uh, who's doing a great job in a really critical um, portfolio of sport. And that's the Honourable Natalie Ward. Uh, she's Minister for Sport, as I mentioned, but for multiculturalism, um, seniors and veterans, all of the strong suits in the community, I think. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to throw to virtual Natalie, Minister. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet as we attend this celebration. For me, that is the Gadigal. I pay respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal people present today. A warm welcome to everyone attending this afternoon's Green and Gold Day, celebrating women in sport, and especially those Olympians, Paralympians, elite athletes, mentors and supporters who are part of the Minerva family. I'd like to thank Christine McLaughlin AM, Chairman and Co-Founder of Minerva, for the invitation to speak with you today. I also acknowledge the great work of Minerva's New South Wales Chapter Leader, as well as the event co-hosts, Business Western Sydney, Sydney Olympic Park Authority, Sydney Olympic Park Business Association and Stadium Australia. Green and Gold Day is for all Australians, regardless of sporting ability. Sport has the power to unite us and the Olympics and Paralympics unite the world in a way nothing else does. Today's event showcases the power of women in business, mentoring and connecting with women in sport, as the Minerva athletes participate in the Tokyo Olympics and prepare for the Paralympics. I'm a very proud supporter of women's sport, and I'm a huge fan of Minerva. You are providing tangible support to young women to advance their careers in sport and aspire to leadership positions. Minerva offers something that's not available anywhere else on this scale. There are currently more than 180 female athletes across a wide range of sports who are given pro bono mentoring, professional development and guidance, and access to a new scholarship program. It's fantastic to see that more than 60 of these Minerva athletes are competing in Tokyo. Research findings consistently rate Australian women's teams as having the highest emotional connection with fans compared to men's teams. In the most recent report this month, the Australian Olympic team was included for the first time and it came in at number one, followed by the Australian women's cricket team and the Matildas. The Diamonds and the Opals were also in the top 10. Clearly, our women athletes are influential role models. They send the message to our young girls that they belong in sport. Raising the profile and upskilling female athletes to realise their potential is important to drive cultural change in sport at all levels, and that's something I am unashamedly passionate about. It also ensures female athletes have the same opportunities as their male counterparts to transition into successful careers post-sport as leaders, coaches, administrators, media commentators, or in business. Sporting codes are starting to realise the commercial and social value of engaging with women and the power of female role models. But sadly, there's still a long way to go for women in sport to achieve equity with their male counterparts in pay, conditions and recognition. In 2021, the New South Wales Government invested $112.3 million in initiatives to support women and girls in sport. This funding includes $150,000 to the Minerva Network to continue and expand the great work you do in mentoring, professional development and guidance for female athletes. Your mentors are some of the most successful female business leaders in this country and we want to work with you to leverage this expertise to help develop initiatives. We want to provide a showcase for current and future female athletes and we're leading the way in hosting major women's sport events as part of the New South Wales Government's 10 World Cups in 10 Years initiative. 
I'm so excited that New South Wales will be hosting the 2022 FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup, that Australia and New Zealand are jointly hosting the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup, and Australia is hosting the 2027 Netball World Cup. Part of our bidding for these events includes a strong legacy focus. I was pleased to learn that Minerva is supporting the AOC and Paralympics Australia in a program of quarantine sessions being provided to Olympians and Paralympians on their return to Australia. These include hosting sessions on resetting life goals, leveraging support networks and building an entrepreneurial mindset. As we see the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on sport in Australia, it's important we focus on regaining positive momentum for women in sport. There's more to be done to ensure that progress continues. With the support of the Minerva Network, we can continue to have a lasting impact and set an example for other parts of our community. Let's celebrate the Minerva athletes and all our Olympians and Paralympians as they compete over the coming weeks. I wish them every success as they do us proud on the world stage. Thank you and enjoy the afternoon. Our Minister for Sport there and a big thank you to Natalie Ward. Some great messages in there, some great initiatives to come and how wonderful to know Minerva Network and our athletes and our para-athletes of today and tomorrow have such a great supporter. Well, let's move on to our first lot of stars for today, a panel of incredible para-athletes and an administrator all looking to make their mark in a few weeks' time. It's 25 days to be exact until they'll be in Tokyo for the Paralympics with 4,400 athletes competing in 22 sports. And the team announcements have been flowing thick and fast this week from Paralympics Australia. Let me introduce them for you now, starting with a couple of speedsters, Maddie Di Rosario. Well, Maddie made her Paralympic debut more than 10 years ago as the youngest athlete on the Paralympic team and has since gone on to a series of stunning gold medals with three Paralympic silvers and 10 world championship medals now under her belt. The reigning women's 800 metre T54 world champ is ready to go for gold at the Paralympic Games. Welcome to you, Maddie De Rosario. Now, Maddie's actually under training from our next guest, an esteemed wheelchair racer in Louise Sauvage OAM. Louise was 16 when she participated in her first world championships. She won her first gold medal in a world record time and has gone on to change the sport of wheelchair racing by becoming one of its first truly professional athletes. She dominated for a decade and raised the profile and changed the perception of Paralympic sport and athletes across the world. She's a true game changer with almost 30 gold medals from Olympic and World Championship events. It's easy to see why she's an Australian Paralympic Hall of Fame inductee and currently the wheelchair track and road elite development coach at New South Wales Institute of Sport and coaches Maddie. Welcome Louise, it's great to have you with us. And the administrator who helps make all of this possible for athletes across our country, Lynn Anderson. With a history in marketing and management of footy clubs, Lynn was appointed the Australian Paralympic Committee's Chief Executive Officer in 2015. Since then, she's won multiple awards for leadership and has been instrumental in attaining some serious government funding for the organisation and signing landmark media rights deals, which allow visibility and viability of the Paralympics like never before. And Linny, you have to see it to be it. So great job. Please make welcome Lynn Anderson. Now to pick the brains of these talents today, say hi to Kate McLaughlin, the General Manager of Sport and the Chef de Michon of the 2016, 2020 and 2022 Australian Paralympic teams. Kate was voted our number one official at the Rio Paralympics, our super chef de mission. Welcome, Kate. The mic is all yours. So much, Amy. Really grateful to be here today and to, uh, to talk to our amazing mem the members of our Paralympic family. Um, I just want to thank the Minerva Network for their ongoing support of our, our Paralympic family. It's brilliant to, to see so many amazing women um, on today to talk to, talk, uh, to us. So... I'm going to first throw over to our amazing champ, Maddie Di Rosario. Maddie, in 25 days time, we are going to be on the ground in Tokyo. I can't wait. We've literally just named our final members on the Paralympic team. We have a team of 182, of which you are a very, very important part. Um, it's obviously been an incredibly difficult um, preparation for these games. 
And I just wanted to talk to you about how the postponement has impacted your your own preparations for these games. I think I think the postponement it kind of came in in I think two waves. I think initially that was really hard, really shocking. Um, and I think mentally it was a bit of a hit. I think physically as well, we put ourselves in in a really good position at our last world championships. We had our 2019 world champs in, in November. And initially, I think we were really concerned about that short turnaround between Worlds and, and Paralympics. I think to learn from your mistakes, reset and do all that in 10 months is a huge ask. But I think we'd put ourselves in a position to really capitalize on that 10 months. And so for that to be blown out by a year actually had a bit of an impact on our physical prep, but also I think mentally how I was going to approach that. Um, in the end though, I think it was a bit of a blessing in disguise. Like we've, we've never had the opportunity to just go back to base work and work on that fitness. And it's so important in the longer events that I do, but something that we've never had time to do. So I think Louise and I and our team really grabbed onto that. And we've just put so much work into making me as physically fit as possible. And then on the other side of that, the mental side, I think we took a lot of time to iron out a lot of, um, I think as athletes, we react to things quite quickly as opposed to um, being prepared for them. Those good results, those bad results. I think we put so much time and effort into how do I be the best athlete on the start line? We don't think about how do I be the best person for myself after that race is done? And how do I, you know, mentally be the best version to then kind of bounce back for the next race? There's not much time to really invest in those moments. And we have had time this time around. So I think it's an unfortunate situation, the postponement, but I think we really grabbed onto it with both hands and used this year to our, our best possible advantage. Yeah, absolutely, Maddie. It sounds like you've taken full advantage of the situation and we cannot wait to see you on the track um, in, in very, very shortly. How does it feel for you to be such an amazing role model, not only to young women with disabilities, but also just young women all over Australia? Oh, it's... um you kind of you do notice it in in moments um I think one of the things that I love about our Paralympic family very much but I think also women in sport at the moment is we're very aware of the impact that we do have on communities I think we understand that people with disabilities and and women are incredibly underrepresented in in every form of media that we have and so I think that every woman athlete I've met through the Minerva Network one of the reasons we're here is because we want to capitalize on the impact that we have. I think we do take that very, very seriously. And so I think that, you know, there is moments where it hits you pretty hard, the impact that you have. And it always comes from a message from a little girl or, or, or her mom or her parent kind of just letting you know. And I think it does hit you because we're kind of just there burying ourselves in training, trying to do the best we possibly can. And then you, you do see that in those moments, what you can do. And I think I'm so proud to be a part of, a family of, of, of athletes, of, of women, of people with disabilities who are really trying to, I think, do everything in our power to really have a really positive impact. And I think that's so important to every single one of us. And so, yeah, we're definitely grabbing onto every opportunity to, to do that. And you're not, you're not just changing the perception of disability for the, those with disabilities either and showing them what's possible. You're also changing the perception of disability for those everybody, for able-bodied Australians. And that's well, just that, such that's, an important thing. That's the thing. I, I think we're, we're a product of our environment and we can all, you know, I, I think believe so strongly what, what how, how we should be viewed and not justify the space we take up. And, and I think us as people with disabilities, yeah, we're, we're doing that, but we're so impacted by our environment and society. And so that also has to change for the, for the 20% of people with disabilities to be able to be the entire humans that we deserve to be, we need the 80% to create an environment that allows us to do that. And it's going to take individuals with big platforms to do that. And so I think all of us do understand the responsibility that we have. Sport gives us that platform. And I don't think any of us take that lightly. So I feel very privileged and a lot of pressure to be one of those individuals. But I'm also so thankful for the platforms that I do get to really try and change, not just that 20, but that 80%. Well, you're doing an amazing job, Maddie. Can I just ask you, you've obviously, this is going to be your fourth Paralympic Games, um, which is amazing for someone who's still so young. <laughs> um, you're definitely one of the, the oldest statesmen of the team, Maddie. How, how does that sound? But how has the movement changed for you, the Paralympic movement, over the time that you've seen it from Beijing 20, 2008 all the way through to these Games? Oh, so much. I, I think even the way 
us as, as athletes are able to conduct ourselves. We, I think and initially you, you knew you were being viewed through a disability lens. And that was, I think, a bit of a battle. You knew that every time you were out there, that's what people were seeing. And you were fighting so hard to, to just be an athlete, to have the world view you how you view yourself. And, and that, I think, took up a lot of energy, space, and it kind of, I think, minimized the, the humanity of the individuals actually uh, as athletes. And it, I think now we've moved on where we, we want to view our Paralympians as athletes first and foremost. And I think as Paralympians, one of the things that we all believe is we want our disability to be the least interesting thing about us, because that's definitely how we view ourselves. It's like the bare minimum requirement of entry into the Paralympics. And the fact that we put that much weight on it, I think is shocking to us. And that's definitely changed. We're now we want to view our Paralympians as athletes and we buy into our Paralympians as, as humans, complex humans with so many facets and these strong, powerful athletes. And, and I, I love seeing that change. I think that kind of gives you this uh, ability to have more impact because we're viewing humans as entire humans and not just through a disability lens. And so that's been, I think, the biggest change that I've seen is just this buy-in of these humans as, as athletes first and foremost. Yeah, awesome, Maddie. And you've had a huge bit to do with that as well can I just take your point there about the way that it's moved and the fact that there's just so much more visibility and move to Lynn because we've just had some amazing news as everyone on the call knows Brisbane 2032 has recently been announced um, and Lynn has had a huge impact on the inclusion of the Paralympic Games into that bid that bid process Lynn can you talk to us about how that bid came about and I guess what the strategy was from PA around how we made sure that there was definitely a Paralympic focus on that on that bid and then ultimately the Games when they come to us in 2032. Thanks, Kate, for sure. I actually think the recent announcement that Brisbane has been awarded the um, Paralympic and Olympic Games in 2032 is probably the most significant announcement in my time. Um, it's just that important for us. And I love the timing of the announcement too, because we know from previous Paralympic Games that, you know, young kids see our athletes, you know, see someone like them, someone like me. We often get that story back. And they used to say, well, I want to be a Paralympian. I want to be at a Paralympic Games. Well, now they can say, I want to be a Paralympian at a home Paralympic Games in front of my family and friends with an incredibly loud, large and very biased home crowd. So that's a gift. You know, most athletes don't get that opportunity and on the global stage to perform at home. So for us, that's a really beautiful gift to a generation of athletes going forward. The bid itself has been a long time coming. It started back in 2015 with a really um, visionary uh, decision, I suppose, by Southeast Queensland mayors who basically saw a great opportunity to um, hold an event in their backyard. And keep in mind, that was before Com Games, which I think was a huge success for us, in, particularly Paralympics. Um, so that was a brave sort of uh, vision back then, but it really went into overdrive during COVID, funnily enough. And I think that's where they were very clever, saw an opportunity that where a lot of other work closed down, um, put foot to the pedal and prepared an extraordinary bid to the point that um, it, under the new IOC new norm, um, we put a bid in very early in earlier 20 um, this year, actually, it's only six, seven months ago, and were rewarded for our efforts by being um, given the approval to go to through to what was called targeted dialogue phase. In targeted dialogue phase, we're, only, we're the only competitor being considered. So it was really ours to lose. Now, that didn't mean we couldn't lose it because there's a lot of um, rules and, and processes along the way. What I've really loved about the new norm process, but, and, and it needed to happen, I'll be very honest, the process was getting just unwieldy for, for cities to be able to afford with lots of, you know, white elephant le um, as a legacy. In this case, it's very strict on the use of no additional expenditure that wouldn't have happened without a Games. And I really, really love that because we want cities to be able to bring these beautiful events to their to our own backyards. Um, I also have absolutely loved the fact that it is legacy and athlete-led. And that, that isn't just words on paper. That was something I saw right through the um, bid and really, really reveled in it, I suppose. Um, so for me, they're the really important bits that, uh, that have considered for us. What I have from, from day one, and I think Maddie's talked about it earlier, when I first started, you know, um, Paralympics are a young sport. We're an evolving sport relative, you know, our first games are 1960. Olympics go back to um, 1896, I think. So we're a young sport, but we certainly believe we're a young sport rising with a, a bullet and a star, as the old um, days we used to say. And so for me, it was really important that in another 11 years time, our big vision was we want to be seen as side by side 
on that global stage at every stage of a game's development. So from for the bid team to bring us in now has been fantastic and we have made We've pushed hard to say, you know, every time you say Olympics, you must say Paralympians and you must consider us up front so that when you're building your um, venues, it needs to have, you know, expert advice from Paralympians around what really is accessibility. You might have a ramp, but a ramp might take you three kilometres out of the way. So all of those issues now, we're putting it up front at the very beginning. And it's been embraced. We've been really thrilled to the point that um, we actually had a couple of nice little wins. The first time ever in a bid logo, you had the Paralympic logo side by side the rings. And that was a really important win for us. Might not seem much to everyone else, but it is is important to us. Um, so for me, it's been actually beautiful that off the back of the announcement, um, there's been really nice recognition from the Paralympic movement and several legendary Paralympians to say we've never seen um, a Paralympic involvement so much. And that's been really rewarding, but got a long way to go. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to getting over to Tokyo very soon and celebrating with all our counterparts from other NPCs. It's, it's a, a certainly a really special time, not only for the Olympic committees, but also the Paralympic committees. Yeah. I'm now going to throw over to Louise, um, a living legend of Paralympic sport, of sport in general in Australia. Um, Lou, I'm going to ask a similar question to what I asked Maddie as well. You know, you've been around a long time. You're now in a coaching role. You're getting to coach Maddie and, and coming over to the Games in that role as opposed to an athlete. How have the Paralympic Games changed over the time that you've been involved? Oh, so much, Kate. Um, yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, this will be my eighth Paralympic Games. That makes me very old. Uh, but I did do four as an athlete and now four as a coach. Um, but, yeah, when I first got involved, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. But, um, but yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, you know, the athletes now, the funding, just the recognition they get, um, the sponsors that have come on board to support not only Paralympics in general, but um, the individual athletes and, you know, them taking, you know, the time to, to see what marketability they have and that, that they're equal. And as Maddie's already talked about that already, and just for me, that is just phenomenal. And for me to be part of that and see this change uh, in Paralympics is just, it just blows my mind and I just hope it gets bigger and better. And you talk about equality, um, that would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> I mean, P Paralympics does mean parallel. So parallel to the Olympic Games, uh, not many people know that. Um, so it's actually perfect um, when you talk about the bid, Lynn, um, with regards to being parallel to the Olympic Games, it has to be Paralympic and Olympic. I say Paralympic first because I'm slightly biased, but um, <laughs> we all are, mate. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I think also when you touched on that, Lynn, about you know having a home games is just phenomenal. I can personally talk about that, and it's just another level. And you know, again, I'm biased that I think Sydney really turned the tables on uh, Paralympics and how it should be and how the athletes should be respected and viewed, and just the the way you know we were perceived and the general public got involved and it was just phenomenal. And I think that's, it's, it's carried on. And to see that go even further in another 11 years would be phenomenal, especially in Australia. Um, I just can't wait to see the athletes and some of the guys, the juniors and, and developing guys that I work with now, you know, for them to have that little carrot there is just phenomenal. So yeah, I've seen so much change over the years and I hope to see it continue and just get bigger and better. And Lou, what about the role of women and how that's changed, you know, over the time and where could that be improved? Because that's something we could perhaps focus on as well, knowing that we have that big carrot of 2032. How can we improve the role of women in Paralympic sport? I think in general, just the opportunities to participate in the sport. Um, but the women, yes, definitely bring it on, I say. Um, I'll take on any more wheelchair races, especially the women. Um, <laughs> uh, Maddie might not like that. Sorry. Um, but uh, <laughs> don't worry, you're still number one. Okay. Um, You'll be having uh, chats later. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the, the opportunity to participate more than anything is, is probably the number one and, and encouraging the women. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times it's, it's whether you have a disability or not, you know, your, your body image is probably one thing that's, it's, that stops a lot of women from doing a lot of things and especially sport. Um, I can honestly say, and maybe I'm at the prime old age where I don't really care anymore, but um, you know, I'm totally out of proportion, but you know, I was built to be a wheelchair racer. So 
you know, I'm very grateful for the body that I have and the function that it gave me and what I ended up achieving. Um, so that, it's just one thing, I suppose, that discourages people, but it, it can also be a positive. Look at it as a positive. Look what you can do with that body that you've been given or, or you know, whatever happens, you know, along the way. So, um, yeah, I think just, you know, the more encouragement we can have for, for anybody to participate, especially women, then I'm all up for it and I'll help you out. Don't worry. I tell you what, Lou, that you say you've got a body for wheelchair racing. There are so many coaches within Paralympic sport across a number of different sports who reckon you've got the body for a number of other sports as well. <laughs> uh, she's been targeted for downhill skiing. She's been targeted for archery, shooting, you name it. And Lou, I'm sure you'd be amazing at all of those <laughs> if you gave it a crack. <laughs> if I wasn't so broken, then maybe I'd have a go. <laughs> That's brilliant. Look, um, I'm conscious of time, but I, I think it would be really good to finish off by just going around to all of you. We've got Tokyo in 25 days time. Maddie, I know that your focus is fully on your competition, but what what is it going to mean, mean to you to be part of the wider Australian Paralympic team? And what are you looking forward to most about these Tokyo Games? I think I'll be so relieved when to, to know that it, that it is going ahead. I think one of the biggest concerns I had outside of my selfish concern about games not going ahead was that the impact sport has on communities is, is enormous, right? Like it's why we invest so much, but it's also why I think we do get the platforms that we have and why we buy into athletes it isn't because it's this, you know, far away, unattainable kind of person. We all relate so heavily to sport. And I think when COVID, our first lockdowns happened, um, men's sport, professional sport obviously came back very quickly. It bounced back. Um, before we were even allowed back in the gym here um, in Sydney is when men's sport was back on our TVs and professional sport. And I think something to, to note there is, is, you know, men's professional sport, it's going to be protected. That, that's what's going to come back. And, and that means that the portions of our community that are affected by the Paralympics and Olympics not going ahead is our women and it's our people with disabilities. So I think seeing the Olympics go ahead, seeing the, the women athletes right now, so many of our Minerva athletes, you know, compete at the moment, like Kate's bronze medal this morning, like Jess Fox's gold last night, like girls are seeing that, you know, young, young moms raising daughters are seeing that. And, and that's, that's huge. And that doesn't happen without the Olympics. We don't see powerful women on our TVs in all of their strength and femininity without the Olympics. And in equal measures, we don't see our, our athletes with disabilities on screens without the Paralympics. And so for the moment where there was that fear about it not going ahead, that meant there was going to be five, uh, sorry, eight years between seeing that and that the impact that would have on our kids with disabilities, our, our young girls is, is enormous. That That's huge. And that's a really terrifying thought that sport would be gate kept from more than half of our community for eight years that was I think you know outside of my selfish reasons one of the Paralympics go ahead that was I think the big fear that that I definitely had is is who was actually going to be impacted by that and so I think to know the Olympics and Paralympics going ahead to to know the impact that's going to have to know that paired with Brisbane getting 2032 I think the dreams that are going to like be fired up you know in the last in, in these two weeks and in the Paralympics 10 days is going to be huge and the impact of that is Honestly, it, it's enormous. And whether any of these kids pursue sport professionally or whether you just get like a generation of healthy, fit, strong kids with disabilities who, who got to immerse themselves in sport, that's huge. And that's the impact the Paralympics is, is going to have. And so that's my one of my big reasons why I'm, I'm so happy that the Paralympics is going ahead. I think that that's enormous. And, and yeah, the impact is, is going to be huge. Thanks so much, Maddie. And just super quickly, Lynn, what's, your, what's the thing you're looking forward to the most about the Games? Kate, the, the opening ceremony, um, you know me well, and I'm a big sook. I will be crying my eyes out with sheer pride that the fact that, you know, with all the challenges that have gone over the last five years, I've seen what the athletes have, have had to deal with mentally, emotionally, everything. They've recalibrated and moved forward, which they always do. But I've also seen you, Kate, and your team and that layer of complexity and planning that these games have brought in with your un, very singular focus on taking a team of nearly 400 will be taking over to Tokyo, taking them in safely, allowing them to perform at their opportunity and have an opportunity on the that they've been striving for in many years, but also to bring them back home safely. That, that to me, just the undertaking that, that our team has done, both athletes and officials, I just could not be more proud and I will have to make sure I pack the waterproof mascara because I'll be flooding it. 
Thanks so much, Lynn. And really super quick, so we've got to wrap up. Lou, what's your favourite event? And you have to say, Maddie, obviously. What's your second favourite event? Oh, rugby is <laughs> the second favourite. First event is wheelchair racing. And I just want to be there. And I just want us to get there. And the most important thing for me is having the athletes actually get to compete. It's been yep. way too long. And that's what I look forward to more than anything is seeing them compete. And yes, wheelchair racing is my favourite. And right, what's your rugby? Woohoo! <laughs> awesome. Well, listen, I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you so much for your time, girls. Um, 24th of August to the 5th of September on Channel 7, 14 hours a day of coverage. Please make sure everyone online tunes in and, and sees our amazing athletes in action. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to hand back over to Amy now. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much. Some real game changers there and some fantastic insights and lived experiences that we can all learn from. A big thank you to Kate for, for holding the panel there, to Maddie, to Louise and Lynn for being involved. Much appreciated. We all cannot wait to see the Paralympics beginning on August 24. Now, a quick reminder that the raffle is still open. It will be being drawn in about 15 minutes at two o'clock. So if you haven't got a ticket yet, jump on and grab yourself one. You can see the wonderful prizes there on your screen also. All right, moving on. Well, next we're going to hear from the supporters of our athletes, the people that help make junior sporting dreams come true and one very proud parent to be interviewed by Kerry Turner. Let me introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, to Daryl Halligan, known to many footy fans as the amazing or the most amazing kicker of his era, Kiwi born. I've said it before, do not hold that against him. He actually played rugby in New Zealand before launching his rugby league career in Australia with the North Sydney Bears and Canterbury Bulldogs. He owns point scoring and goal scoring records along the way, but now is a commentator and kicking coach, but has one other really important job and probably the most important job. He is a parent of Bronte, a member of our Aussie Stingers water polo team, which is absolutely killing it, by the way. Bronte, of course, scored three goals for the Stingers in their defeat of Canada, but beaten the Netherlands, and they hit the water to play Spain tonight. Welcome, very proud dad, Daryl. Thank you for joining us today. And joining him for this interview is Kerry Turner. Kerry is a former world champion herself. She played 108 test caps for Australia in water polo, competing in five World Cups and two World Championships. Her passion for sport has fueled her professional career. She has over 25 years experience working across Australian sport. That includes board and advisory roles in sports and in government. She's a multi-award winning project manager and innovator and a strategist and is currently leading the New South Wales government's women in sports strategy called Her Sport, Her Way. Welcome to the microphone. It is all yours, Kerry. Thanks so much, Anna. and that last panel was just a delight. I really enjoyed everything about it. And I'm loving the Olympics. I'm sure you all are. And it just reminds me so much. It's about the stories behind the stories. It's the individual triumph that's backed by the unconditional love of family and friends. It's about the green and gold and we've got, we tear up every moment. But for this Olympics in particular, for me, it's the wonderful bond that's coming out between the fathers and their daughters. Um, kicked off the other day by um, Kaylee McEwen and a wonderful gold medal win, um, dedicated by, and inspired by her late father. I mean, gosh, that was so emotional. But right today, we have Daryl Halligan with us. Daryl, the proud father of Bronte Halligan, who plays for the Stingers in number cap number four, who had an, uh, an amazing debut, scoring a hat-trick against Canada. Daryl, I could hear your family from across the ditch cheering. What does it feel like right now to be a proud father of an Olympian? Tell us what it feels like, Daryl. Oh, Kerry, and first of all, welcome to um, everyone as well on the Minerva Network. Um, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, it's been a really special uh, experience for the family. Um, you mentioned across the ditch. Um, yeah, look, I've got um, grandparents and uncles and aunties who are off on their way to things like line dancing, saying, hey, the whole line dancing class is following the Australian water polo team. And you're saying, how does that work? You know what I mean? And I, I guess um, as part of our, our family living here, preparation um, to watch Bronte is, is actually celebration. Um, uh, we painted a, a, one of the sheets we grabbed off uh, one of the beds with um, the Olympic rings on and uh, go Bronte, Australian water polo, and we threw it over the balcony and it's proudly hanging there now. 
Um, and for me, look at me, green and gold. Who would have thought, you know, I've got a whole new apparel here. I've got hats and caps. And then all of a sudden, but I don't know where this one came from. Uh, that one Ooh. sort of like, better get that out of the road. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's been awesome. I don't know if green and gold are my colours, but uh, they are for the next uh, couple of weeks and well into the future. Well, um, they suit you and they suit Bronte. I was so proud of her performance, Daryl. She's a sharpshooter like a dad. Um, and I just, I just know, like, she's had such, such a success already in water polo. She made the Australian team at 17. She was gunning for that um, 2016 Rio Games, missed out. And I think the fire in her belly for this one is really, really important. What have you observed as the key qualities in your daughter that's got her to where she is right now? Um, I mean, you know, with one of four children, you don't like to speak one against the other and you, you try and treat them more as, as equals. But Bronte's always been competitive. Um, her detail has, has got a lot better as she's got older. She, um, she is a team player. I'll ultimately um, admit that. She likes the defensive part of the game first before the attacking part of the game of water polo. Um, and I was sort of trying to remember, she... She wasn't one of those um, kids that sort of won all the school relays or the swimming championships when, you know, schools would head off to their carnivals and that, but she'd always be part of the, the relay team. And, and she wasn't always first out of the bed either when the kids swim in the morning. And um, she'll tell a story where I used to actually wake her up. And I, I thought I was just giving her in the morning a little tap on the side of the head to say, hey, Bronte, come on, time to get up, you know. And, and apparently I was drilling her in the forehead like, like this to get out of bed, but uh, maybe she's exaggerated that a little bit. But I always thought it was quite nice and just given. But she apparently sort of had like nightmares from that, she reckons now. But uh, in the end, um, you know, she got up, she competed with the rest of the um, the children, um, and, and and she developed a little bit later too, which is quite nice. Yeah, the dedication's an extraordinary for any water sport because it's a 4 a.m. start quite often, isn't it, Daryl? <laughs> I mean, you're a land man. You must think we're crazy, us water people. <laughs> I actually quite like it. It's a, it's a beautiful time of the morning and um, it makes you get up and, and make the most of the day as, as many uh, people do. You know, they, people struggle for hours in the day. Sports people don't. They, they use it wisely um, and they go about their business. It's fantastic. Like all the Minerva Network um, um, athletes, Daryl, um, Bronte is just a high performer outside of the pool too. She's studying at the UCLA, a psych degree with a major in um, or a minor in disability um, area and I think uh, Lynn Anderson would be very happy about that, your yep. former colleague at, Bank, at Canterbury Bankstown. Um, but she did say the other day, hey dad, and she doesn't have a Kiwi accent, does she? Just checking. <laughs> she said, hey dad, I want to play professional water polo in Italy just like you did as a rugby player. I mean, that must have been so amazing for you to hear that because opportunities now are very different for women. What would you like to see in the future for women? I hadn't actually grasped that in, in, until that moment, um, which again was a little bit late. I, I marvel at the opportunities the children have, um, you know, to go to college and, and, and follow their one academic careers and also their sporting careers now too, um, such as Bronte, you know, there's swimmers, the rowers, you know, she's got friends who are soccer players out of um, Australia that have gone through UCLA with her. Um, in America and they've, they've had fantastic opportunities and so for a young woman to understand that those opportunities are out there to for, for them to, to flourish um, is magnificent um, and then just the other day um, Bronte came home and she said oh possibly after one of the Olympics I might like to go and play off in Greece or Italy and she said oh I think I'll go to Italy because you played some rugby in Italy before you played rugby league dad and I, that was one of my first professional opportunities was to go to uh, to Italy and, and play some rugby union before coming to the league. And she said, I think I'll go down that Italian one just to, to keep it a little bit synopsis in the family. And um, it sort of triggered something going, wow, these, these girls really do have opportunities out there now where possibly, you know, back uh, in my teens, it might, might not have been the same opportunities there in front of them. And, and you just have to embrace that and go, you know, it, it probably makes them different people. Yeah, and you're not the only uh, footy dad. Um, we've got Phil Kearns, the father of Tilly Kearns. There's something about this rough and tumble play <laughs> that transcends into the water, isn't it? Well, Phil's got more of a swimming background. He was actually a swimmer before he um, played played uh, rugby. And I actually played against Phil in um, some under-21s games um, back in the day. So our careers um, were 
courtesy of the children, Tilly and uh, Bronte cross paths again now. We um we argue many things of sport, trans Tasman, as you would <laughs> un understand, but we have a common goal in the in the girls, you know, with, with what they're achieving at the moment, and, and we're both in all really. I mean, um, Phil's got um, a couple of strapping lads as well as uh, also another daughter, so they're a fairly sporting family. But um, the girls get um, equal presence in that household as well. Well, my final question, Daryl, it's been so much fun talking to you, but we do know that fathers play a unique role in, in, in sort of supporting their daughters, um, not only their social emotional well-being, but, you know, growing sporting skills. And a quick shout out to the University of Newcastle people that are tuned in today. It's a guy called Professor Phil Morgan has done a lot of research in this. And you are a really a great representation of what it's what it what it's about to be a father. You've got three daughters, they're all amazing athletes and a son as well. Um, any tips for any dads chiming in? And I do think Nick Hockley, the CEO of uh, um, Cricket Australia, might be chiming in as well. He gets what you're about to say. But um, any any um, any tips for fathers uh, today about just supporting your daughter on their journey in sport? Oh, I just think you. There's a couple of great ads on at the moment, which I really embrace, and it's about getting them to the start line. Um, you know. Uh, we used to have this big um, Volkswagen Caravel um, minibus that would just um, basically load kids up with and take them off to the swimming pools, to Narrabeen Sports Academy there or Ringa Aquatic, you know. And basically what you're doing is actually just facilitating them, getting them to the start or, or putting them and giving them their introduction to sport. And then just do it over and over again because they'll soon grasp that, take it to the next level. And before you know it, you're smiling like anything and you're mm. sitting here watching um, your daughter in Tokyo and providing so many happy things for many, many other parts of your family, you know, and even your newly adopted country, if, if that's what it is, you know, it just opens up so many connections um, by just giving a child a start. And, yeah. and that's all, all fathers do and, and mothers do it too. I always, um, even now when I hold my dad's hand, it always feels like it calms me down. So look, it's so wonderful, Daryl, to speak to you. Go the Stingers, go your daughter. They play Spain tonight. Everyone needs to tune in. Um, you must be so proud. And I, um, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, you can have this wonderful experience. I just don't know how long I can continue to wear this on the go. This doesn't come off now. I mean, uh, <laughs> the game's not till uh, 10, to, 10 to nine tonight, but it stays on all, all afternoon. Love it. Over to you now, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Daryl. And thank you, Kerry. And a reminder to everyone that game does start tonight at 8.50 against Spain. We wish them all the best. Well done, Kerry. Well done, Daryl. And the Dads and Daughters program certainly uh, gaining a lot of traction with all those Olympic daughters in competition at the moment. We're going to move on now and hear from some of our superstar Olympians. Some of them have been there and done that, winning medals. They're here today to share their insight into success at the most elite level. So let me introduce them to you. Jane Wahlberger, or Jane Moran as she was when she played water polo, is or was an aspiring teenage player and remembers watching Australia as a teenager win gold at the Sydney Olympics when the women's water polo was first introduced to the Games. Jane won bronze at the 2012 London Olympics in water polo, is the Athlete Commission Chair and a Board Director with Water Polo Australia. She's a civil engineer and a principal at Global Engineering and Advisory Consultancy, Oricon, who's also a Minerva official sponsor alongside Accenture. And she's a Minerva mentor. Jane has been the recipient of career shaping mentoring programs and is now an advocate for all the benefits Minerva provides to our stars. Welcome, Jane. Alicia Quirk represented Australia in international rugby sevens. She won a gold medal at the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio, which was also the inaugural Games Rio. Born in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, one of my favourite places, had an expected last year that she would be chasing gold at the Tokyo Olympics, but when her hopes of winning back-to-back -back Olympic golds were put on hold in 2020, she used the break to pursue her other lifelong dream, and that is motherhood, watching on this year with her actually named baby Matilda. And I know she was there earlier. Maybe she's disappeared now. She'll get a cameo from her later. Alicia, welcome. Daniel Kowalski, an Olympian in uh, 1996 and 2000, became the first man in 92 years to win medals in the 200, 400 and 1500 metre freestyle events at the same Games. 
but it's his silver in the 1500 metre in Atlanta that he's perhaps remembered most for, and we'll touch on that in a little moment. Despite securing the Australian 1-2 behind Kieran Perkins, Dan saw the silver medal as a failure. We'll dig into that. He's also recently opened up about depression and eating disorders during his career. He's now the Olympian Services Manager for the Australian Olympic Committee and he's helping athletes make the difficult transition to everyday life after retirement. Welcome, Dan. It's great to have you with us. And a face you've all seen and, and are all hearing at the moment, especially if you're watching beach volleyball. We know her as the golden girl who won gold on the sands of Bondi in 2000 with Natalie Cook and because of their gold winning medal partnership at the Sydney Olympics and their bronze in Atlanta in 1996. Kerry Podhast, in fact, first earned fame as an indoor volleyballer representing Australia for 10 years and a knee injury forced her off the hard court and onto the sand. And as they say, the rest is history currently commentating on the games and will soon appear on SAS Australia. A very big welcome, Kerry Podhast, and all of our four Olympians. So much to talk about. Where do we start? Well, Kerry, the Olympics has been absolutely awesome so far. So many Minerva athletes have been in action. A godsend for all of us sitting at home in quarantine, but it must bring back some pretty amazing memories for you. What stands out the most? Was it collecting gold, climbing on the dais, or, or was it something else? I think it was the last point, Amy. I think it was the last point that landed out that kind of hit me like a bulldozer. You know, the ball was flying through the air. I chased it all the way to the line and then I let it go out and Natalie just screaming at me and diving on top of me. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you just, the focus that you have to have at that point as an athlete, you know, the match point or, you know, your final or whatever it is, is just so narrow. And then the moment that it happens, you touch the wall, you kick the goal, you, you know, you serve the, the ace, whatever it is, and you win the gold. And it's just like everything kind of explodes around you and you look up and you see everyone in the crowd, of course, not happening in Tokyo, but in the other Olympics, you see it all, you see the people and um, when it hits you that you've actually achieved your, your dream, your goal, everything that you've been working for, not just for four years, but for decades in some cases with many athletes, it just hits you like a bulldozer and you experience every single emotion that, that there is. Thanks, Gary. Jane, what about you? Were your Olympic memories in the pool or out? And how did you feel the first time you dived in as an Olympian? Oh, I think um, the the biggest memory was walking through the stadium for the opening ceremony. It was like, I'm finally here. Um, I had a bit of a, a story where I was one of the last uh, not to be selected for the 2008 Beijing Games. So I really took a, a knock to my ego and had to take quite a bit of time out and, and reconvene and really, really discover that, no, nope, I'm not done yet. I need to get back here. Um, and memory wise, it's probably the photo in the background. That's not actually a medal winning photo. That was when we won the quarterfinal against China in extra time and penalty shootout. It was absolutely down to the wire um, and just such elation that, that we were uh, coming up to, to be able to, to go for a medal. Awesome memories. Um, well, Alicia, you had a, a meteoric rise to the national team um, and then a gold straight away right out there um did you think that you were a middle chance when you first went in yes most definitely we did um, when I first started playing rugby definitely not I had no idea what I was doing and um yeah was really shocked by the whole introduction into the sport but as soon as we kind of got the ball rolling and centralized our program in 2014 there was really no looking back and I was thinking about memories just then and one popped to mind was um, Charlotte took a quick tap on the line in the gold medal match versus New Zealand and she dove over and, score and scored and just before the game the Kiwi coach had said how soft we were um, as a rugby nation and that we feared the black jersey and she got up from that moment and said that's how a bunch of touchies beep play rugby <laughs> and that really stuck home to me about how far we had actually come um, as a group and as a bunch of touchies that open mail um, that asked us to invite us to come along to the camps and try the sport of rugby for the first time and try our hand at winning a gold medal and that we actually had done it and that put us ahead um, two tries 
um, in front of them in the game and knew that we kind of sealed the victory. So, yeah, it was an incredible, incredible to be a part of and so fortunate to have so many family and friends in the crowd to celebrate with as well. Very different to today. But before we move on to today, Dan, a quick question. We heard Kerry say we trained for decades to get to that moment. Four, eight, 16 years for, for one shot at one race that might last a minute or, in your case, a couple of minutes. Why? You know, I couldn't be further removed. You ask that question more and more. But, you know, living in this country, you the sport is a massive foundation and, I came here when I was five, and so it was a, con a connecting point for me to be able to meet people. So I quickly learned that um, about the Olympics and the Olympic spirit and Australia's tradition, and, and I wanted to purely and simply be, be a part of that because it had resonated so powerfully with me. Well, let's move to Tokyo now because, you know, it's a different game. It's a very different game. And just quickly I'm going to go around and ask you in, in a real short answer, who are you looking forward to or have looked forward to seeing most in action in either the Olympics or the Paralympics? Kerry. Well, I'm going to have to say the beach volleyball players. Um, first of all, the males, uh, Chris McHugh and Damien Schumann, they qualified it just in the last few weeks before the Games and had to quarantine and, um, you know, for almost a month beforehand. And then when they came back to Australia and then they got over there and they played an incredible first match. They're now out, they've been knocked out, but our girls, Taliqua Clancy, Maria Feyatacho, Del Salah, they are going for gold and they're up again today at four. I have to rush off and commentate them, but they're definitely a team to watch. Um, they're in, in the hunt for gold, absolutely. And Jane, for you, apart from the Stingers, perhaps? Yeah, obviously. Um, I'm also going to be tuning in at four o'clock to see T Taliqua and Maria Fe. Um, and just listening to Maddie speak earlier, I'm so excited for the Paralympics to start and I will be tuning in to her races. Alicia. Obviously, the Rugby Sevens girls, their quarterfinal is tonight against Fiji, and I'm so excited to see them bounce back after a bit of a shake-up versus the USA today. Um, Maddie has always been a favourite of mine um, and being a part of the Minerva Network um, with her and seeing her grow and develop as an incredible athlete, as well as Riley Bat and the wheelchair rugby um, competition for the Paralympics. They are incredible athletes and they will be unreal. And Dan? As Olympian Services Manager, I can have no favourites. I would <laughs> to do well, but Jess Fox last night was, I'm still getting goosebumps now thinking about that amazing result. I mean, they've all been amazing, but that one really touched, touched me. And um, Ellie Cole, a uh, massive fan of Ellie Cole for a long time. She's just a great ambassador like Maddie for the Paralympic movement. And I, I really hope she does well. All That's well. awesome. <laughs> Well, we've touched that this Olympics is really different um, compared to past Olympics and mostly because of COVID and the fact there's no crowds. Um, we, we're trained as athletes to peak at a point, but that point moved. It moved a whole 12 months. So, Jane, as athletes, we are taught to mentally prepare for these challenges, but how different is this challenge and how would have you approached it? Yeah, like I really reflected on this. Um, I know that... You know, you can look at a, a squad of athletes, but the older athletes that were hanging in there, you know, they were waiting to have surgery. <laughs> they were waiting to have babies. They were <laughs> waiting to start their careers. Like I really felt for those athletes. Um, I think, you know, it's been really inspiring to see how much they've all just gathered and, you know, this is the Olympics and it doesn't matter that it's one year late. Um, I think that, especially the team sports can be quite affected just because we haven't had as much international exposure and experience in the lead up to these games in water polo for instance all of the european and the american countries have been based in europe for the last few months so they they've been used to playing each other the aussie stingers have had zero international experience since the 2019 world championships so it's just it's really walking into the unknown and just really uh, having the faith that we have prepared as best as we can. Well, Dan, COVID, as you said, causing havoc, no crowds. How would it be to swim with no cheer squad? Not well, being able to hear them. I've been actually surprised at how loud it has been considering they were strong and no cheering. But I, I feel like if you're the type of athlete who really needs that crowd encouragement, then obviously it's, it's going to be extremely difficult. But 
I was one who never really heard the crowd or really saw the crowd. There were a couple of times, well, a lot of times actually, I was in races where Kieran was breaking world records or Grant Hackett, Ian Thorpe. And so the crowd was seriously loud then, but that was more demoralising because you knew you were a long way behind. But I, this no crowd thing, it, I feel like it might be harder for the spectators and us watching at home than for the athletes and coaches and officials. Well, Kerry, Aussie support's never too far away. The Olympic Village is there. It's, it's very different, though, wouldn't it be, this, this time around? Yeah, I think what the um, the athletes in Tokyo are missing out on is that um, just the, the camaraderie of all the countries and, and being able to hang out a lot in the food halls and chat with, you know, people from different countries, countries that have names on their backs that sometimes you've never even heard of before, um, and ch chatting with other like athletes from other sports as well within the Australian team, you know, having to be quite isolated. I know they've got a, a good setup in Tokyo with the Aussies themselves, but they definitely spend a lot of time in their room. They have to find, you know, very simple things to do. And our girls, I know they've they've struggled a bit with that. You know, the, the word has come back that you know they've. They've really struggled with the time between matches. Normally in tournaments, we run tournaments on the world tour over three days and their tournament's going to be over, I think, um, almost 10. So it's a, a big stretch. But, you know, you, you just have to roll with the punches and that's, you know, what sport's all about and that's what our sports psychologists and success and mindset coaches will be, you know, teaching the athletes to do. Roll with the punches, just do what you have to do. You, you know, they have planned for this. They knew what it was going to be like in Tokyo a long time ago. They knew that it was going to be tough um, and they've set themselves up to just make the most of it. And Alicia, we can all tell why, or we all know now, why you missed uh, this year's Olympics. So congratulations. But I want to ask you a different question because coming home from an Olympics or a Paralympics can actually be a bit of a bittersweet experience. You, you're happy to come home because you've been away for a really long time and you want to share success if you've had that or, or condolences with your, with your family and friends. If you've won gold, everyone wants a piece of you and you're, you're very familiar with that situation, sometimes for free too. They expect a lot of you. Um, but then comes this lull period. So can you share with me your experience of coming home, what that was like, and what could have been done better to support you? Yeah, I think the elation was slow to wear off, but it definitely wears off after a period of time. And, and the messages stop, stop coming and the influx of um, support stops. And because we were a professional program, the next job, the next tournament comes around and you have to just get back on the horse and put the, the gold medal behind you. And I think... Um, from both organisations and mentor programs alike, I think having that support network being greater and deeper to just facilitate the unknown um, is probably the best way to do it um, and the, pe the best thing to enable athletes to help transition into that time. And you've trained for four or now five years for something that you've wanted so much and whether you obtain that or not, there is still a little bit of a an empty feeling of oh it's happened or it's over and it's done just like that and then how you reshift the goalposts or how you readjust to normal life um there's a huge gap in that space and we're, we're doing a lot of work but it's things like Minerva program and having someone that's there that you can rely on 24 7 outside of your family network that can really be a point of difference for athletes to be able to move on to something that they find just as passionate or gives them just as much purpose, whether it's the next competition or motherhood or the next phase of their life that they're going to enjoy just as much and put just as much effort into. Because we all know Olympians are an elite level of human beings and the way they carry themselves in life, they've got the aptitude and the um, ability, to, ability to apply themselves to anything. They just need a bit of guidance. That's a really great answer. Let's explore that a little bit more because this time around, Jane, our athletes are going to have to quarantine on the way home if they're coming back to Australia. That would be pretty mentally challenging, I would think. Uh, how do you think we can help them get through it? I know Minerva Network is running some quarantine sessions. You can uh, tell us a little bit about that and how you think uh, what support they require. Yeah, absolutely. So in um, partnership with the AOC, Minerva is running some quarantine sessions um, just to really help the athletes explore options to help them understand what they're feeling because we're going to have such a variety of athletes in quarantine in a place they 
probably don't want to be. There's going to be people like Alicia that are coming off an absolute high that have just won gold. There are going to be people who might have a medal, but it wasn't what they were after. There are going to be lots of disappointment. Um, so there's just such a variety of athletes um, without the support network that Alicia mentioned. So what Minerva and the AOC are doing is just really trying to um, patch that bubble, I suppose, of support um, in the absence of their usual support network. Um, Dan, I read an article about you where it said you beat yourself up about the way you saw things soon after your career and your swimming career ended. And um, you've recently opened up about some of those challenges. Do you want to share them with us and how you found the new you and what you wish you had during that transition time? Yeah, I guess it's one of those things where my sole focus, um, singular focus was that of, of winning an Olympic gold medal. Um, and to come away from Atlanta, not having achieved that, um, I really felt like I'd failed and let my family, my friends down, my support network. And it was really hard to, um, to come to terms with the fact that it's something I should be proud of. And I, I worked very closely with a psychologist in the end, but for me, it was ingrained that that was a sign of weakness. It was a sign of vulnerability. Um, I had amazing support around me and it was all there for the offering. But I think in a lot of cases, many people are guilty of this. They don't want to be seen to be needing help because you're the best in the world. You can handle this. But the reality is my approach to it was the worst possible approach I could have taken. So I think learning to be proud of it um, took time. Um, and it meant just being able to get into a position where I could talk about it, I could articulate it. And it could be genuine and I actually meant it. And so for me, that process took nearly 10 years. It wasn't until about 10th anniversary of the 96 Olympics where I was like, wow, I'm super proud of this. And I mean, I had my 25th, Kerry, 25th from anniversary from um, Atlanta a couple of days ago. And every year I message Kieran Perkins to say happy anniversary. And some days he responds going, what anniversary? So it's different how my approach to it now is one of absolute pride and joy. But it meant working with people very closely to, to get to that point. That's really great that you can share that story and hopefully uh, inspire athletes that follow a similar path to, to follow your direction and learn from your experience, Dan. Thank you. Kerry, we have seen the, the face of sport really change and um, female role models, both Olympians and Paralympians, are now such a thing. It's wonderful. How can we share these stories better? Minerva's doing a wonderful job to, uh, to expose uh, our female athletes in particular with its coverage, its mental program. But what else can we do or what else should we be demanding? Well, a whole lot more. I think, I think Maddie said it beautifully um, early on where she said that women's sport really get highlighted during the Olympics and Paralympics only every four years. Um, so I think one thing that I'm really passionate about is being able to share your story and being able to highlight what you've learned through your sporting journey. So um, as athletes, I think we need to learn how to do that. So how to, and it doesn't mean standing on a stage is, and that's what I've been doing for 20 years, you know, a motivational speaker, but it just might mean being able to share your story at your workplace, you know, in a boardroom, um, in a job interview and being able to articulate what you've learned and, you know, the skills that you have that you're going to bring to life after sport. And I think we can really inspire the nation. I mean, it's fantastic seeing all our women winning gold in the last couple of of days um, and we can really continue to inspire the nation if we learn how to, to articulate our stories really well in a, in a way that um, is easy to understand the lessons and then we can relate that to the audience that we're talking to whether we're talking to a corporate audience or a bunch of school kids or a you know a bunch of you know young um, Olympic potential athletes so that's something I'm passionate about and I want to help people with and um, I think we need to make sure that athletes are aware of that. It's not, a, it's not media training. It's not about how to talk to the media. It's about how to really find out what is my story. Dig deep, dig deep, peel the layers of the onion back like Dan, Dan's done in the last few years and really understood what he's learned from his journey. And he, he can now articulate that. And of course, sometimes that means vulnerability, doesn't it? Exposing yourself in something that you're actually scared to 
to let out there, but some great ideas there. We did get some great news and, and we touched on it earlier this week that um, Brisbane was announced as host for the upcoming 2032 Olympics. And now all of our athletics careers may be over by then, clearly, although some of you will be seeing lovely in commentary boxes. Um, but Alicia, what does it mean for today's generation? I think it's absolutely massive. I was fortunate enough to be at the unveiling at Brisbane Live site and the buzz in the crowd was incredible. And, you know, having a daughter of my own now and watching this Olympics 12-year-old skateboarders winning gold medals, I'm thinking, come on, Matilda, it's time to start our training. And that's what I think Sydney did for, um, the, whole of the, for the whole of the cohort that I have, you know, been through the Olympics with it ignited a little fire inside of us all and my mum she started you know putting the platforms in place and letting me have a go one of the big themes of the Olympics have a go at whatever I could and I think Maddie said it brilliantly too about we hopefully by this announcement have a generation of fit young healthy Australians that are going to use sport to spearhead their lives and that we get some incredible Olympians off the back of it and Paralympians as well. So it's so exciting for our country to be able to host it again. After playing at a Commonwealth Games on home soil, the buzz is like no other. I may come out of retirement form it, for it, um, or hopefully I'm just a part of it and maybe coaching because that's the other area that we need more female participation as well, or just a, a mentor to one of the athletes as part of the Minerva Network. But it's so exciting for both the Olympic and Paralympic committees to have it here in Brisbane. It sure is. And Jane, just quickly, your advice to aspiring athletes? Just do it. <laughs> Give it a go. There's a there's a big um, program at the minute. Hashtag have a go. Um, if if 2032 isn't isn't the beacon to just give things a go, um, and I don't know what is. So absolutely everything's available these days. And yep. Dan, a couple of the traits that uh, athletes can take from their uh, sporting careers into everyday life and business? I think it's that attention to detail and, and that discipline. When you when you do the sport and you love it, it's it, it's fun. It's, I never saw it as a sacrifice. I saw it as choices that I wanted to make. And, and to me, that was fun. And I, I think they really need to continue that confidence that they have, the discipline and the attention to detail and, and take it with them to all their phases of their life outside of sport. And for me, that's one of the things I, I really hope that they do do because it can be difficult and intimidating going into a different environment and working way up again, but they just got to remember that they started somewhere in their sport and they got to that point. So take all of that with them. And Kerry, is it resilience or belief, self-belief or both? What's most important? Um, it depends what time of your journey you're at. Uh, obviously, resilience throughout your journey, you know, when things go wrong. But at the Olympic Games, when you're standing on the blocks, when you're you know, about to serve the first ball or the kickoff or whatever it is, you're on the start line, it's belief, 100% belief, because everything that you've done in the past, if you have one little skerrick of doubt, then that's going to just kind of accentuate things that don't go well. So believe 100% and that's what gets them over the line. Wonderful. Well, to our panel, thank you so much. So much learned today. I really appreciate your time, your vulnerability um, and the access to you too in this, in this important couple of weeks. Um, Jane, Kerry, Alicia, Dan, enjoy the rest of the Olympics and then the Paralympics. And thank you so much for your time today. Okay, it is time now to uh, welcome back Christine McLaughlin AM, our chair and co-founder of the Minerva Network, to say a few words on behalf of Minerva. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone, for contributing and participating today. You've all given your time, the panellists and those of you who've tuned in to join us. It's just it's quite overwhelming. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been screaming at the TV screen in recent days and and I hope that that will continue. I really can't thank enough on behalf of Minerva Network in particular, uh, big, big thanks to our event sponsors and partners who made today possible um, to, to change from, I'm not gonna say pivot, to change from a, um, an event at uh, Stadium Australia where the 2000 Olympics were, to be an online um, format um, was all done very quickly. So thank you all. Um, and Dan's been working hard behind the scenes on that. Really a uh, huge thanks to our event sponsor, 
Western Sydney University, um, Dr. Andy Marks, we heard from you earlier today. It would have been very easy for you to um, pull away um, when we moved away from a physical um, session. So really, really appreciate that. Um, Business Western Sydney, Daniel Mackay and David Borger, amazing um, to have you supporting us in this way. Um, Sydney Olympic Park Authority, Tony Hulius, thank you very much, Tony. Sydney Olympic Business Chamber, Alison Taylor, thank you. And of course, our much loved Arthur Stanley at Stadium Australia and also Venues Live. I mean, Arthur's been involved with Minerva from the get-go and certainly um, helped us get today together. It would be remiss of me not to also acknowledge our, our partners from inception being uh, Accenture and Oricon, uh, who have given us just so much support. Also, wasn't it wonderful to see our new sports minister and um, isn't it great that she is so passionate about women's sports? So thanks, a big call out to Minister Natalie Ward. Um, couldn't believe that Alicia um, is on with us today uh, with Matilda. Uh, I didn't catch a sight of her because the Minerva Network all started when uh, Alicia came back pretty much from uh, Rio with the Rugby Sevens girls. And Alicia has been very important in helping us shape up what Minerva can do, as has Maddie Proud and Maddie Di Rosario and Rachel Haynes and Elisa Healy and so many other of the athletes that you'll see. Um, of course, we've got some athletes in action today. I think we've got um, a slide to show you of some of the Minerva athletes that are competing today. Um, and obviously, uh, Amy's already called out some of the great, the great wins. And we're really thrilled because we've got Melanie Brock uh, on the ground in Tokyo, uh, Minerva champion, and she's um, trying to connect with as many as she can over there, which is terrific. So thank you all. I think you've heard lots about what Minerva does. I think what's important now is you know that our, our next chapter, we would really like to um, expand uh, our diversity footprint. We'd like to involve many, many more Indigenous athletes and obviously through Louise and Lynn and others, we are looking to um, extend our mentoring to more, more of the Paralympic Olympians. Um, our goal is to support a thousand of our amazing women athletes by 2025 and ideally by the time we get to Brisbane um, Olympics and Paralympics all the women uh, competing will have Minerva mentors or be involved in what we do. I'm really excited about the, uh, the master classes that we're going to be doing um, with the AOC. I think that's going to be really important um, we've learned a lot over the last few years about how we can help athletes and we'll be doing that. Really what you want to know is who has won the raffle. So uh, the raffle has been independently drawn and I think the winners are going up. Um, but I've, I've got a little cheat sheet here. So um, the Bank West Suite winner, Sally Lone. Uh, golf with Elisa Healy, Silvio Marinelli. I hope you're a good golfer, Silvio, because she certainly is. Kerry Burgess, the training session with Maddie, Maddie Proud. Lucy Judd is off to Vivid. Uh, Alison Hilda is off to Hamilton. Um, and Cherry Chikorovsky, a Western Sydney Wanderers jer jersey. Well, that might challenge her uh, where, where, she, uh, where her support goes. Thank you also for those of you who've made a donation today and who have um, contributed to the raffle. It all makes a huge difference. Um, we're now going to leave you with some really beautiful good luck messages um, that have been sent in for our teams competing in Tokyo. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, please stay connected with Minerva Network. Follow us on our social media. Um, be part of what is really this growing movement, uh, which feels like a family. Thank you very much. Over to the, uh, the good luck messages, Amy. Oh, you've got to pump it up. I'm Kimberly from SMV Breakers. My favourite player is Bronte Halligan. Go the Stingers! Hi, my name is Talia and I'm in the SNB Breakers 14s team. Wishing you all the best of luck at the Olympics. You guys are awesome. I love watching you. Go for gold, Stingers. I'm Katie. I'm in Breakers. Oh. Have we gone? Oh, we seem to have had a couple of technical difficulties there right at the end. Just give us a few moments and we'll see if we can get those back up on screen. 
If we can't, thank you everyone for your time today. We hope you enjoyed the session, that you learned something um, and that you understand the really great work that the Minerva Network is doing. If you'd like to get involved, don't forget you can make a donation through the Australian Sports Foundation. Until next time, enjoy the rest of the Olympics and the Paralympics and have a wonderful green and gold day. Let's hope we can top it off with some gold tonight. See you later. I'm Kimberly from SMB Breakers. My favourite player is Bronte Helgen. Go the Stingers! Hi, my name is Talia and I'm an SNB Breakers 14s team. Wishing you all the best of luck at the Olympics. You guys are awesome. I love watching you. Go for gold, Stingers. I'm Katie. I'm in Breakers. Come on, Bronte. Let's do this for the Stella girls. And go, Stingers. We really hope you win. I'm Nat Ryan. I play for SMB Breakers. My favourite players are Bronte and Hannah. Go the Stingers. Bronte, come back and coach. Hi, I'm Emma from Under 12 Breakers and my family's been watching every single one of your games and go Stingers, I love you guys. Hi, my name is Chloe from the SMB Breakers. My favourite player is Hannah Buckling. Go Stingers! Hi, my name is Jess. I'm from the SMB Breakers. It's been really cool watching the Australian water polo team at the Olympics. Fingers crossed for the next few games. Hey, I'm Ayana from the SMB Breakers. My favourite player is Bronte Heiligan. Go Stingers! Hi, I'm Sophie from the Breakers. And we hope you win. And yeah. My favourite player is Bronte because she went to Stella and I go to Stella now. So yeah, we hope you win. Hi Stingers, my name's Isabel. I play for the Breakers. And good luck to all of you Australian Olympians out there. Especially you Stingers. Go, Bo go Tilly, go Keisha, go Hannah, go Bronte. Don't you know, pump it up, you got to pump it up, don't you know, pump it up.